Coming up on Need to Know, Dr. Brad Burke on the accident that changed his life and his career as CEO of the University of Rochester Medical Center. Rochester's news magazine since 1997. This is Need to Know. I'm Julie Phillip. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Need to Know. Dr. Brad Burke is a CEO on leave at the University of Rochester Medical Center. The 56-year-old Brighton High grad took over as head of the medical center in 2006, another stepping stone in his stellar career. But on May 30th, in a matter of seconds, Dr. Burke's life changed dramatically. I recently sat down with him to talk about the accident that injured his spine, the struggle to recover, and what the future holds. I was uh, out for a nice ride on a beautiful sunny day, and there's a turn that's a hairpin turn on the ride back. And um, you come down from a big hill into Vine Valley, so you can see the hairpin turn. So I always check to see if there are any cars, and there weren't any cars. And when I mean, you watch those guys on the motorcycles, you know, bending their knees down low to the road, that's what you get to do in that hairpin turn. So there I was, coming around the hairpin turn, bent over, and all of a sudden there's a car there, big white car, and it's halfway on my side because it's a very sharp turn. And I looked at the guy, and I was very surprised to see him. So I tried to uh, slow down and brake and there wasn't enough room on the road, so the bike uh, ended up skidding over onto the side of the road. And I had a choice at that moment, which was to uh, fall down, but there's a very steep embankment and a guardrail uh, that leads down to a stream. And going over the guardrail and whacking it didn't seem like a very good idea. So I tried to do a, a mountain bike maneuver, which is put all your weight in the back tire, skid the tire around, and head the other direction. So I did that, I skidded really well and turned the bike around and said, okay, I'm gonna pedal to get out of the way of the car. And when I pedaled, uh, I don't know what happened, but I went over the handlebars. And uh, afterwards, my son told me that the tire had blown. So when it was in the um, gravel, it uh, either hit something sharp or just, because it's a road bike tire, it uh, blew. So I went over the handlebars. And I remember as I was going over the handlebars going, oh no. And uh, then I heard this snap, loud snapping sound. And I wasn't sure whether I broke my neck in the air or when I hit. But obviously, in retrospect, it probably I landed, hit, and, and broke my neck. And as I was laying there, I could feel all of a sudden that I couldn't feel. And um, even my arm suddenly lost feeling. And I was panting on the ground. So I knew that this was a pretty high fracture in the cervical region because I was having such a hard time breathing and my arms weren't working. So I thought I'd fractured the fifth cervical vertebrae. And um, the guy in the car had stopped and he came up to me and he said, did I surprise you? And I said, yes. And I said, don't touch me. I think I broke my neck. And I said, do you have a phone? Well, we need to call 911, which, which he did. And then I said, give me the phone. I'm going to call my family. So I called my family, and I told them you know, that I had this accident and that they should come, and then uh, told them when they got there to call the emergency department and to get in touch with Dr. Maurer and um, whoever the attending in the ED was. and You had it all set up. Had it all set up, yes. <laughs> what was going through your mind about how bad this was? Uh, I knew it was bad. Um, I was worried that I was going to die right there, that you know my diaphragm wouldn't work and I would just die there. So I knew it was really bad. And after a little while, um, a policeman came and... Um, Literally 10 minutes later, the ambulance came. So by then, I was feeling much better I was going to make it. And um, <laughs> the only 
The only distressing thing was that the um, uh, Mercy flight that was coming couldn't land. The helicopter couldn't land where I was. I was hoping they could, but they couldn't. So I had to get in the ambulance. They took me about half a mile down the road where there's a big field. And that's where the helicopter landed, and they put me in the helicopter. So I was feeling, you know, that I was going to get to the hospital, and they would do whatever they would do. And I told my wife, I said, I'm so sorry, <laughs> because I knew what was coming. And I knew she would have to drive all the way back and not know, and mm -hmm. um, that it was bad. I read something where your daughter, on the day of the accident, told you, everything's going to be okay. And you said, no, it's not going to be okay. No. And she said, it's been a lot of hard work since that day. What did she mean? What did, what did this do to you and your family? Yeah, well, this was definitely a family experience. My wife you know, moved down to New Jersey um, for the three months I was there. And part of the reason we went there is my son lives in Jersey City, about 20 minutes away. So he would come every Wednesday, and we'd have dinner and boys' night out, and uh, he'd come on the weekends. And um, so this was a big family experience. My daughter, Mariah, she got very involved in, in this event, went to um, the um, bagel bin in uh, Brighton, and she got interviewed on a number of the radio stations, TV stations. They had a big display there for people to put cards and well wishes in. Uh, my youngest daughter, Sarah, she ran the New York City Marathon and raised money for the Christopher Reeve Foundation for spinal cord research. And you know, I cried when I read her um, bulletin, which you know, really she wanted to do something that was as challenging as the challenges that I was facing. And you know, her successfully doing the marathon would be assigned to me to successfully complete this. So and not only did she complete the marathon, she was one of the top fundraisers she was. for the, the mm -hmm. Reeve Foundation. She was. Y you've said that the outpouring of support from people has been very humbling. Can you describe the sort of reactions people have had? Well, it's been truly an outpouring. You know, there have been thousands of um, messages posted on the um, Internet site that we set up. Um, in the hospital, 10,000 people are wearing these little BCB buttons around all the time. And um, people that I hadn't seen in 10 or 20 years sent me um, cards and emails. Uh, friends of mine uh, would come to visit me in Kessler. Some of them came multiple times, and they were just fantastic. And that support, it was humbling to just know that so many people were caring. And the letters were so heartfelt, so sympathetic. And in the beginning, I was a little reluctant to accept all of this sympathy. But then I learned over time that people want to help. They really do. They just are so um, warm-hearted, so um, good at you know, giving to people. And I've always been a health care provider, never a recipient. And so it took me a little while to understand how to be a good recipient. And, now, you know, I always, whenever anyone comes up, I always stop, and if they have questions, I always explain the questions, and I always have enough time for people who care, um, because for me, that's my way of giving back for all the support I've had. How do people t treat you differently than before the accident? A couple ways. <laughs> the one that you always read about and hear about is just being in a wheelchair. You're uh, small. and one of the nice things about this wheelchair is you can actually raise it up. It has an electric motor, and I can get up to five foot two. And it makes a big difference. When you're in a crowd, when you're down there, people don't see you as much. Um, so raising up is a big deal. So that's kind of the most obvious one that everyone talks about when they're in a wheelchair. But I think the uh, two-way communication that occurs from being in a chronic situation where you're injured or ill or something, you really learn to depend on people. And you quickly establish these interactions with people where um, you're communicating your needs and they're communicating their wishes to you. And you establish a quick emotional bond. So I think the good thing has been a real um, interest on my part to 
understand how that emotional bond is created and to create it with people all the time. And uh, part of the reason I wanted to come back as CEO is I think the medical center will really benefit from attention to that area. And uh, I've been talking to the nurses, I've been working with our strong commitment group, and a lot of that really is to make our own healthcare providers' jobs better by facilitating their interactions with their patients. What did you experience as a patient that really bothered you and made you think that this is an area that needs attention? Um, well, what I realized isn't, wasn't the bothering side, it was the positive side. Um, there were a group of people that I would say had caring hands, that's what I called them. Um, they like instantly came up to you as a patient and touched you and looked you in the eye and told you who their name was and what they were there for and you know, establish this instant compassion and interaction. And the two words that I like to use are compassion and attentiveness. And the story that I think best exemplifies that is when I was in the ICU, I'd been there about 10 days, and this nurse came up to me who was, you know, taking over um, uh, for, on a break. And she said to me, Dr. Burke, you really look like you need your hair washed. Have, has anyone done that? And I said, no, is that possible? And she said, yes, we can do that. And she went and she got this bag that they have for ICU patients, and she put it on my head and washed my hair and then dried it. And that was the most pleasurable thing I'd experienced in 10 days. And I'm not sure she even knew the fact, but the only part of my body that could feel was my head. And so she had done something incredibly nice to the one part of me that could feel. And that kind of compassion and attentiveness, that spontaneous, oh, there's something I could do that would make you feel better, that's what I'm talking about. So it's really the positives. And of course, I made her feel so good because I told her that was the greatest. You have no idea how good that felt. And she felt really good that she had done that. So it's that two-way um, interaction that's so incredibly important for both the patient and the provider. You continue your physical therapy, which is having a tremendous impact. I remember seeing one video where you said, oh, I got my bicep on Friday. Oh, yeah. How does it feel when sensation or, or strength returns to a body part? Oh, it's fantastic. Um, because it's a threshold phenomenon in many situations where you can't do it, you can't do it, and then one day you can. And you know, it's like watching a one-year-old suddenly stand up and then suddenly walk. It's those threshold moments that are, are so exciting because you want it to happen, but you're just not sure if and when it'll happen. So um, about three weeks ago, all of a sudden, I could brush my teeth. I'd been trying, but I could never hold the thing, and it would fall out. And, but you know, you keep trying, and then all of a sudden, one day, oh, I can hold it. And t I can tell you, brushing your own teeth feels really good. <laughs> you can do it a lot better than anybody else can. So those moments, those breakthroughs are incredibly positive. You read Helen Keller when she was making each of her strides to learn how to speak and to, um, and to write and to understand Braille. There are breakthroughs and all of a sudden you get it. And it's incredibly uh, gratifying when that happens. Along the way, though, there must be frustration moments when you're feeling down. But overall, you're extremely ambitious, strong, you mm -hmm. know, positive personality. How do you overcome those other moments? Yeah, so I write a lot of grants, and um, grant writing has been a very helpful training exercise for this because they're hard to get, the grants. And so you know that the pay line might only be 10%, only 10% of the grants get funded. So when you get one funded, you feel really good. And when you don't get one funded, you say, okay, I'll go to the next one. Because you just can't linger on the failures. And it's the same thing here. You really celebrate your successes, you remember those, and the failures, you know, you just say, the next day I'll get it. You know, some days are good days, some days are bad days. And you enjoy the good ones and ignore the bad ones. And uh, I try to avoid the frustrating things. So eating was very frustrating for a long time. And when I was at Kessler, we had lunch class 
myself and a bunch of other people who were all kind of at the same stage, we would go to lunch and they would make us, you know, work on eating at lunch. And it was kind of uh, unpleasant because the way they allowed us to eat was they would put a guard around the plate. So you would mush your food up against the guard, then you could stab it and bring it to your mouth. And you know, I could eat maybe half the lunch before I'd be exhausted because it was just so hard on my arm. And then I'd be tired. That arm would be tired for the rest of the day. And I couldn't do a lot of other things. So finally, when I came home, I said, forget lunch. I'm going to let people feed me <laughs> and put my energies elsewhere. And then, you know, when I could finally use my biceps pretty well, so I said, I bet you I'm strong enough to eat. And sure enough, I could eat by myself and I didn't need the guard. And it was a much more satisfying experience. So I think it's two things. One, it's just keep trying. And when things are frustrating and you can't do them, then just don't do them. Let someone else help you out. When you started as CEO, you really um, started to build the medical center's research arm and, and, and aim for national prominence as a research institution. Has mm -hmm. this experience been a setback to that work priority or professional priorities? Uh, no. In fact, the medical center has done incredibly well. I think this year we're going to set a record for NIH funding. I think it's going to be up about 13 percent, which is a huge increase, and aided in part by the stimulus package. But certainly the research arm is growing. And you can imagine my own interest in <laughs> spinal cord injury and neuroregeneration. And I'm on the New York State Stem Cell Board, NYSTEM. And I couldn't be more excited to be working there and funding these grants. Because stem cells are going to be part of the way that people with injuries like mine recover. So I think the research piece is incredibly important. But obviously, the clinical piece is equally important. And what I learned from the accident is these two words we say all the time, quality and safety, which is our number one clinical priority. I now have really strong understandings of what those mean. And I think we as a medical center began about a year ago to really focus on quality and safety. And I'm more determined than ever to make a strong, a, a zero um, tolerance place. That is no tolerance for mistakes. So we had things like line infections. We reduced them by over 90 percent this past year. But the goal is to have zero because it should be just like the airlines. That is, you get on the airline and you're extremely comfortable that the plane's going to get there, whoever the driver is, whoever the pilot is. And it needs to be the same way in the medical center. You as a patient have to feel you're in a safe environment. That's the foundation. Once you're safe, then you can have all those good interactions that I just mentioned. And quality comes from safety. If you have a culture that focuses on safety, it will also focus on quality. And the third thing I realized is service, which is this interaction between the provider and the patient, is incredibly important because it's key to satisfaction. People choose to be in the healthcare profession because they want to do good, they want to help people. But they also, from time to time, need to get the satisfaction of having a patient say, thank you, that really felt great, or I really appreciate the care. And so we need to work on that component as well. Research has been your passion as well. Have mm -hmm. you gotten back into the lab? Yeah. When I um, was at Kessler, even, I got a... Uh, um, PC computer that had this program called Dragon Naturally Speaking that's a voice recognition system. And so I could answer my emails and using just talking into them. And uh, the lab would send me their data every Friday by email and I'd work on it over the weekend and send it back to them. So the lab kept going and actually I submitted a grant in November, only a month after I got home. And uh, the lab's doing great. The biggest problem I had is there are a fair number of people in the lab, and uh, they usually stay for two or three years. So every year I have to hire five new people. And so during those six months I was out, I didn't hire anyone. <laughs> so I've been very busy trying to hire people to replace the people who are leaving. 
Um, so the lab's actually done very well. In fact, I think it was a good experience for them because a lot of them had to take on more responsibility and, and um, you know, get more organized since every Friday they had to get me their data. What does fully recovered mean to you? Uh, fully recovered in the simplest sense means being able to do all the things I need to do to do my job and to enjoy my family. Um, you, of course, hope you would recover to your same function as before the accident. That's another definition of fully recovered. Um, but I'm happy somewhere in between, I think. Um, what I said to myself right after the uh, fall was that if I get out of this without needing to be on a respirator, I'll be happy. And that's still my philosophy. So everything I've gained beyond that right now is really icing on the cake. Because the accident I had is very similar to the one Christopher Reeve had. And as you know, he unfortunately did not regain his um, respiratory function, couldn't breathe on his own. And as a consequence, you know, he didn't move very much and ultimately died of the complications of that. So I feel very fortunate to have gotten beyond just being on the ventilator. Um, so everything else is uh, a great challenge and a great pleasure when I accomplish it. But to be fully recovered means back to work, back with my family. You've said you will return as CEO when you can put in mm -hmm. a full day's work. Mm -hmm. uh, any idea when that might be yet? Um, well, I think probably in the springtime. The um, physical therapy is going great. And as long as I keep um, gaining uh, new abilities, I'm going to keep doing it as full time as possible. Uh, even when I come back, I'll probably still do it three times a week, something like that. Uh, just to make sure that I get back to full strength. They say usually it's sort of one to two years is the full recovery. So I'm only at seven months. So I think another three to four months um, will get me pretty close to um, being able to come back full time. Energy-wise, I'm fine right now. I stay up later than my wife. <laughs> but um, it, it takes a lot of time out of the day to do therapy. Three hours right now. Finally, for the people watching this, what do you want them to take away from learning and, and, and hearing about your experience? Well, first, I want to thank them. Uh, so many people reached out to me, and I can't always thank every one of them. So this is one of the main things I want to do is thank everyone for supporting me and, and being there. And um, I am really grateful. And I hope as a CEO to be able to, in some measure, um, not pay them back, but, you know, acknowledge their gift and show them by inspiring people that it's, it was a worthwhile gift. So the second thing is to inspire people. I think many people have illnesses, have chronic problems, and I think it's part of life that you're going to have an accident. And... The key that I've discovered, as we talked about, is to have the determination and the will to um, keep fighting through it and to really hope for the best. And uh, my goal really is to inspire people to do that and to make people want to um, take the challenge and to not give up and to be an advocate for themselves. Uh, and the third thing is for the medical center, I want to come back as CEO and, as you've heard, impart some of my own experiences to make us a better health care delivery system and to make it more satisfying for our employees so that they really um, enjoy their job even more fully than they do. So lots of reasons to come back. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure Julie, talking to you. my pleasure as well. Thanks. Dr. Brad Burke, CEO on leave, at least for a few more months, from the University of Rochester Medical Center.
Coming up this week, WXXI's Center for Public Affairs is tackling the issue of mayoral control of the Rochester City School District. Every weekday afternoon on 1370 Connection, we will devote one hour to the topic, bringing in academic experts, Mayor Robert Duffy, school board members, state and city lawmakers, and city parents. You're welcome to call in with your thoughts and questions as well. Again, that's 1370 Connection every weekday afternoon at 1 o'clock on WXXI. AM 1370 or listen to the live stream at WXXI.org. I'm Julie Phillip. Thank you for watching this edition of Need to Know. If you'd like to watch today's interview with Dr. Burke again, we will be putting it on our website, WXXI.org. We'll be back next week with an all-new Need to Know. I'll see you then.